On this channel's Patreon page, we have a tier called the Masters of Fate. Every month, the members of this tier convene together and pick a topic for whatever video I should end the month with. And you know, I figured that whoever would donate $8 a month to me would obviously like me and would want me to watch good things. Neon Genesis Evangelion. <whistles> they chose Disaster Movie for March. She is a national treasure! <laughs> it goes without saying that 2008's disaster movie, written and directed by Aaron Seltzer and Jason Friedberg, is one of the worst movies of all time. It's bloated, boring, and 100% outdated. Everybody who discusses what I call the movie movie series talks about this at length but no one talks about how they came to be. How exactly did anyone think that this? Is that your feet? Yeah, and this is my baby's foot. <laughs> was a good idea. Well, I guess we're really doing this. Here is the complete history of Disaster Movie. <sighs> so to set the stage, the glory days of Seltzer and Friedberg being hot comedy commodities was now long gone. They were no longer the respected members of the scary movie writing team. Now in the eyes of Hollywood, they had become directors who could make things on the cheap, were able to generate ticket sales from young adults who loved their crass humor and pop culture references. <laughs> Seltzer and Friedberg knew that they weren't making art. They were making something stupid again and again and embraced it wholeheartedly. And then rock falls on his head. We've already done that joke uh, twice. We did that one too. Whenever somebody criticized them for having lowbrow humor or poorly thought out scripts, they didn't care. In the words of Aaron Seltzer, I think the first movie, you're always surprised, like, oh wow, we're not gonna get a 100% Rotten Tomatoes score? And then you go, it's not a critic's cup of tea. And some people don't like it, and then you move on. Otherwise, you go crazy. For the time being, shutting the critics out seemed to be the best idea. Ever since the release of Epic Movie, the tide had fully turned against the duo with many physical and online publications calling for their removal, or on some blog posts, even their deaths. That's a little much. What I'm trying to say here is that they were gonna keep on keeping on, and only a box office bomb was going to stop them. So, once they wrapped production up on their latest movie, Meet the Spartans, Seltzer and Friedberg got right into their next project, a full-on parody of the movie Superbad which their critics proceeded to call one of the dumbest ideas they've ever had. Whether you like Superbad or not, it's kind of hard to deny that a full parody movie, especially made by Seltzer and Friedberg based on this classic film, would have little to no potential. During the writing process, Seltzer and Friedberg actually got the hint and decided to stray further and further away from the original Superbad concept. This new project, which still retained the original title, Goody Two Shoes, was starting to become more of a parody of the typical disaster movie you would see at the time, such as 28 Days Later or Insert Flavor of the Month here. But even that premise didn't stay around for long. It wasn't long before Seltzer and Friedberg returned back to their old ways and decided to have the script revolve around whatever was popular at the time. Such properties included Hannah Montana, Enchanted, The Love Guru, Hancock, You Don't Mess With The Zoan, Is That Your Feet? My Super Sweet 16, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, and many, 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 many more things. Some of which are still remembered today, but many of them are not. <laughs> the thing about Seltzer and Friedberg that I'm sure we all know is that these movies were never intended to be viewed years in the future. They were only made for the here and now. Nice. It didn't matter that, say, The Love Guru was a bomb or that nobody remembers My Super Sweet 16. As long as audiences at the time were able to recognize some of these lampooned properties, they would entice people to go check the movie out to see how they would tackle the subject. Since many of the properties that Seltzer and Friedberg would be parodying weren't even out yet, they resorted to trailer footage to get their information. 
I am Prince Caspian. I am Prince Caspian, here to save Narnia. But that wasn't much of an inconvenience for them because they weren't exactly trying to parody these properties. They were more just including them for the sake of brand recognition and hoping to get a laugh. Much like how the disaster movies of the time were trying to top each other by getting bigger and bigger, Goody Two Shoes was attempting to top the other members of the movie movie series by having far more references than the other movies combined, to the point where that would be the entire premise. Once the vision and script were firmly put in place, it was time to get the funding together as well as start working on distribution plans, but that turned out to be the first bump in the road. You best be getting out of that Mach 5 or I'm a toe tag your ass! Get that weak shit off my track! Regency, who had funded the previous entries in the movie movie series, Do I look like Will Smith to you? were no longer interested in doing business with Seltzer and Friedberg, so instead, they had to seek funding from Grossover Park, and similarly to how Regency was no longer interested, their former distribution partners 20th Century Fox decided to shut them down. So Lionsgate stepped in instead. From there, it was time to get the cast. It feels like home to me. For the leads, there were newcomers like Matt Lanter, Vanessa Milano, and G Thang, but for some of the other cast members, Seltzer and Friedberg relied on some of their friends slash regulars. Seltzer and Friedberg may not make good movies exactly, but they sure know how to treat their cast. Frequent contributors of their movies would include Carmen Electra and Tony Cox, who would often be paid at SAG scale so that they could just be a part of this experience. They loved Seltzer and Friedberg and always had a great time on set. So what if they're not getting paid very much, they're getting to hang out with their friends? It was basically that era's equivalent of what Adam Sandler was frequently accused of in the 2010s. Don't mind if I do! Those regulars knew exactly what to expect, but for the newcomers, even though they read the script, they were in for a complete surprise. They all flew down to Shreveport, Louisiana to get filming, and right away, Volano said that she got the idea for exactly what they were making during their first day of shooting, which is the scene where she wakes up in bed with Matt Lanter and a Flava Flav impersonator. Flava Flav! Yeah, it's one of those movies. But even so, almost everybody was quickly able to roll with the punches. The only person who wasn't was the most notable of the newcomers, Kim Kardashian, who was making her big screen debut. When Kim signed on to this, she didn't read the script. So needless to say, whenever she found out the shocking things that Seltzer and Friedberg wanted to include in Goody Two Shoes, or, you know, the fact that her character dies halfway through the film, she was appalled. It's rude and it's making me look bad, so stop. Even so, there was no backing out now. She'd already made the commitment, so she had to bear with it. But hey, there's always going to be one stick in the mud. Everyone else was having a great time, despite all of the <clears throat> disasters that were plaguing the set. Firstly, it was always boiling hot on set. They were filming in Louisiana in the summer. If the heat alone doesn't get to you, the humidity will. This caused some low energy from the extras, which is most notable in the party scene early on in the film. And not only is Louisiana known for its boiling heat, but also its mosquitoes, which were everywhere. Half of Disaster Movie was filmed outdoors, so in those scenes, especially the opening that parodies 10,000 BC, the cast was having to lather themselves with coat after coat of mosquito repellent in order to stay somewhat untouched. There was also a very busy schedule for the actors involved. In order to save money on paying actors, the cast would often be recycled from scene to scene, which is why the credits look like this. Nobody got to be just a bit part, the only exception being the person who played Carrie Bradshaw, who was actually the craft services guy. Yeah, he wasn't supposed to be in the movie, they just approached him during lunch and said, Hey, you want to be in the movie? And of course he said yes, I mean, it's a movie after all. There were also a few injuries on set, most notably when one of the stunt actors got hurt during the WWE scene, but none of that was able to get the cast or crew down. Besides, Seltzer and Friedberg run a tight ship on set. You wouldn't expect that given the tone of their movies, but everything has to be just right. You're allowed to have fun and goof off, 
but not when you're on the clock. Time is money, after all. That's what happens when you're doing a movie. But this didn't stop the cast from doing their own thing, like G Thang being a pickup artist on set, or Matt Lanter compulsively working out to get ready for the big shirtless scene early on, or even Nicole Parker intentionally letting herself go for the Amy Winehouse scene just so that Matt Lanter's disgusted reactions could be fully authentic. According to the cast's input on the DVD commentary, which for the record is infinitely better than the movie itself, considering that it's just a bunch of friends laughing and swapping stories. <laughs> <laughs> she was great. This right was here. a great scene, Krista guys. Is yeah, this is a great scene. Nice. <laughs> Anyways, according to them, having such a good time on set and this apparent camaraderie between them since day one was important for the chemistry on screen. The jokes wouldn't land if the people weren't having a legitimately fun time. And that's true, acting can only get you so far. The energy that Goody Two-Shoes required with the tone that it was setting up needed the cast to be truly happy. The thing about G, oh here we go, is that he's always doing stand-up routines. After about six weeks of shooting, the first cut of Goody Two-Shoes was ready for testing. See, testing is one of the most important parts of the process to Seltzer and Friedberg. They go about this in a very strict way. First of all, no one over the age of 25 is allowed in any test audience whatsoever. Secondly, the audience has to be predominantly filled with African Americans and or Hispanics. Apparently that's their biggest demographic in terms of popularity. I'm not really sure why, but okay. Thirdly, and most importantly, Seltzer and Friedberg would be listening in to the audience's reactions. If one of their jokes didn't get a big belly laugh, it was gone. Don't forget, it's Seltzer and Friedberg's mission to put as many jokes as possible in the movie movies, so they would have to be paying very close attention every single second. The jokes didn't have to be clever, they just had to get a reaction. Once this process was over, two cuts of the movie were completed. One would be an R-rated version for the eventual home media release. He's f***ing wolf, ain't that a pity? Cause I'm f***ing those bitches from sex in the city. And the other would be the PG-13 version for theaters. He's dating wolf, ain't that a pity? Cause I'm dating those broads from sex in the city. And they finished them just in time too. They were getting pretty close to their intended release date. Generally speaking, these lowbrow parody movies tend to be released in January, which is a notoriously slow box office month where only the worst of the worst movies get released, so only then could they turn a profit. But Lionsgate either had enough confidence in this movie, now renamed Disaster Movie, to have it compete with summer blockbusters, or the more likely solution, they knew that if they waited till January to release it, all of these properties would be old news. They had to release it as soon as they could. But in doing so, they didn't leave enough time to market the film. Oh sure, they tried by releasing trailers, signs, and posters, but it wasn't enough time to get the audience's attention. When Disaster Movie was released on August 29th, 2008, it only had a $5.8 million opening worldwide. There was also no hope of the movie rebounding either, because the few people that did see it, most notably the critics, were not impressed. Seltzer and Friedberg's other movies never reviewed well in general, but it seems like everybody had a new level of hatred for Disaster Movie and let their opinions be known. What you're seeing on screen is a collection of some of the nastiest reviews we could find. I mean, look at these. You'd think that this movie ran over their dog or something. Disaster movie. Just a title or a self-fulfilling prophecy. Frankly, if you laugh even once, I recommend psychiatric help. It's a one out of five, and that's being generous. Within a few weeks of Disaster Movie being released, it was already considered not one of the worst movies of 2008, but one of the worst movies of all time. It was at this moment that Seltzer and Friedberg's career had officially collapsed. The last members of their core audience seemed to turn away from them, leaving only negative reviews and a 34 point million box office return against a $20 million budget, making this a box office bomb. The very thing they feared most. 
Some of the film's actors, most notably Kim Kardashian, would later disown the movie in later years. I don't feel like being with them. I don't feel like talking to them. I don't feel like spending time with them. I really have a bad feeling about this. I think we need time apart. It killed me, sir! And as for Seltzer and Friedberg, they could no longer ignore the hate. The fallout from Disaster Movie caused them to develop their next film, Vampires Suck, in relative secret. It was rarely advertised or promoted in pre-production events, and the already small number of interviews that the two would agree to take part in had dropped considerably. They could no longer ignore the fact that they were Hollywood pariahs who could basically never come back. And in later years, after Vampires Suck bombed, they tried to reinvent themselves with the more tongue-in-cheek Starving Games, or the non-parody film Best Night Ever, both of which bombed. <laughs> after the release of their final film, Superfast, they've seemingly disappeared. They've teased the occasional comeback like a Star Wars movie or something, but it never came to be. And it's all because of Disaster Movie. That was the snowball that started the avalanche that destroyed their career. Honestly, as much as I don't like Disaster Movie, the story behind it makes me see it in a whole new way. This really was just a bunch of people getting together, making what's essentially just a crappy YouTube video, having some laughs, making some new experiences and some friends along the way. And yes, it was terrible, and yes, everyone rightly hated it, but it seems like the creators were trying to learn from their mistake. This was the last entry in the Movie Movie series, since the Scary Movie series doesn't count. So for Seltzer and Friedberg's standalone films, they tried to go back to their roots and just parodying one subject, but then after that didn't work, and after being more self-aware didn't work, and being more original didn't work, they had to give up. But at the same time, they should have seen this coming. The bubble created by Scary Movie all those years ago would pop at some point. And since Seltzer and Friedberg kept overinflating that bubble beyond its capacity, they shouldn't have been surprised when it burst. But yes, that, my friends, is the complete history of Disaster Movie. Something that started off as so much fun and then became, well, anything but. Well, folks, thanks for watching the video. What'd you guys think? Have you seen th this wonderful thing before? If so, what did you think of it? And what was your favorite part? Comment below and let me know because I'm always excited to hear what you guys have to say. And now it's time to thank our wonderful Patreon people, starting with our Masters of Fate, who I just so happen to be very angry at at the moment. But still, they paid to have their names read, so here we go, I guess. Brian Dassault, Chan11, Drew the Stew, Kev Messick, Micah Mann, Platinum Bass, Quiet Chap, Ryan Williams, Timey, Toko Blahuvian, and Woody Woo. And now for our executive producers, Albert Robinson, Blackjack, H.R. Hoffman, Indiscreet One, Kurt Bruenning, Leaf Storm, Ravioli Supremo, Unkale, Vanilla the Rabbit 98, and who else but Zane? If you two would like your name read at the end of every Media Mementos video, then why not consider donating to the Patreon? There's a link in the description below for you to check out. Also, there's a link to the Media Mementos Twitter and Discord server, so stop on by and say hello. Alright folks, thanks for watching the video, and I'll see you guys next time. Uh, are you happy? Turning this stuff out. Meet the Spartans made 85 million dollars. Yeah, but does that mean it's any good? Yes!